the topic of games and the future of culture. And I think um, none of these folks actually need an introduction, but I'm, I'm just going to do an introduction for everybody up front here. Robin Haneke joined TGC, that game company, in 2009 as a producer. She's a designer and computer scientist by training. Her prior work includes family-friendly friendly franchises like My Sims and Steven Spielberg's Boom Blocks for Nintendo Wii. Robin is an active organizer for the IGDA, LA's annual IndieCAD Festival, and the Experimental Gameplay Workshop at GDC. She's finishing a PhD in artificial intelligence at Northwestern University. And today, what I hope we can talk about is really culture writ large, because we've had um, art as culture in a, a variety of presentations beforehand. Um, we've seen several images from, from Renaissance Italy, um, Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel and things like that. We've seen two uh, presentations that had uh, Edward Moybridge in, in it as well. Um, not that I have anything against Moybridge. There's a lovely show up at SF MoMA right now on his work. But it's been, it's been you know, that's, that's a kind of conservative notion of, of art, and it's also a conservative notion of culture, which includes both high and low culture. So um, I just thought... Maybe to, to start things, uh, thoughts off, I'd quote uh, Robin from her website where she says, Games are often considered crude, different from other art forms, but in just over 40 years they've changed the way we think about computers, theater, television, and film. They redefine how we consume and produce entertainment. To expand their expressive capabilities, we must solve some non-trivial problems. So I thought... Um, Robin's word has a nice, nice way of getting us launched into a more expansive field of culture. So I'm going to hand over. So uh, I can't say anything really meaningful. I'm not as smart as Ian, so I'm just going to say a few things that were inspirational to me when I was thinking about the future of what we might experience with games. And I'm going to talk a lot about E. Um, some of you may know that I work um, throughout the year to promote the idea of experimental gameplay. There was a time when the concept of experimental gameplay was strange and unusual, and now it's not. And I think in the ways in which Ian was saying, uh, games have become much more ubiquitous and much more acceptable to our culture, which is fantastic. So I'm not going to talk about that E in particular. I'm going to talk about um, a little bit more important things than experimentation, which may sound strange coming from me, but they're things I care about a lot and have come from the evolution of my perspective as a designer, uh, similar to Rudd's, um, thinking more and more about what the influence of our medium is on our culture. And I'm going to talk about three of them. And typically when we see these three letters together, we think of something very alternate to what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to talk about elegant, expressive, and emotional games, triple E games. Um, <laughs> you don't usually see them. But they're out there, and they're out there in different ways. Um, and I, I wasn't really quite sure how to express this model. So what I did was I first started with thinking about what I meant by elegance. I looked into it. I saw a couple TED Talks. Um, you know, you know those guys. And uh, I sort of settled on the definition of elegance that satisfies the top quadrant of this graph. It's, uh, it's sort of a scientific uh, simplistic model, but um, nevertheless, the idea is that if something has high impact and low cost, it's an elegant solution to a problem. So uh, the reason that I picked this definition of elegance um, is because if you think about it, any concept, any product, any publicly consumable good goes through a phase of evolution as it first it's released into the environment and then future versions of it are produced. Um, the actual people that make it evolve concepts and tools which, and solutions to problems which reduce the cost associated with making it, improve the impact of that thing, whether it's a game or a cell phone or um, a really delicious dinner. Um, and the ease of use over time evolves. Um, they ev evolve the user experience, uh, they reduce the barrier to entry and broaden the appeal. And it, it doesn't necessarily mean that um, they're broadening the appeal to the point of making it uh, common 
or less valuable or more accessible or easier, but this is the appeal is broadened for that product. So for example, opera is broadened in ways that many of you probably don't appreciate, but there are people that spend a lot of time thinking about how to broaden or expand the appeal of opera to a certain group of people. Um, and to me, elegant solutions do both of these things. So when you look at the spectrum of what games might be or what, what things might be in the future, one way to, to consider would be to look at how elegant they were versus how Baroque they were. And if you don't like the opposite term, you can blame Ian because it's his idea. So <laughs> it used to say complex and I had a lot of other words for it, but I think Baroque is a good word. Um, neither of these things is necessarily better than the other. I mean, I, I love Baroque clothing. I love, I love Baroque experiences. I, I love steampunk, you know. Um, but I also really appreciate minimalism. And I think one of the things I was really thinking about in terms of what, what's happening with games is that because we're able to think now more elegantly about problems and solve them more elegantly as, as designers and producers and coders and sound designers and so on, is that we've moved a little bit away from Baroque solutions, but there are still many out there that are really compelling. The second E is expressive. Uh, players speak uh, when concepts and tools allow players to perform their preferences and express affinity. Um, and the experience responds when it's celebrating that performance and that expression of affinity. And, and, and expressive games or expressive products, things people use to, to, to broadcast their affinity um, are, are really popular right now. In fact, if you think about it, the word social is often synonymous with this kind of expression. And I didn't want to say in the future games will become more social because that, that word, as Ian was kind of alluding to, is a little bit tainted right now for people in my industry. But, but it, expression is a thing I'm really comfortable with. And a lot of the games I've worked on have included tools for users to make their own puzzles, make their own designs. I mean, Sims, something I spent a lot of time with, fundamentally, is an expressive concept. And if you were to sort of look at the same space, now incorporating expressive, you could also sort of look at the underlying, uh, sort of the, the anti-expressive as being something scripted, um, formal, some, something that's really fixed, more like a proof, less like music being performed by a person live. So if this is a space, then I felt like, well, there's got to be another axis. There's something else in the space that that I really care about, and I think we're seeing more and more of uh, with games and game culture, and that's emotion. Emotional experiences create their, they create new feelings within a player, right? They, the, the concepts and the tools of these games or products or experiences, whatever you want to call them, are about players expressing themselves, but actually also feeling new things. And they're shaped by those feelings. So the experience anticipates the emotional state of the player and then responds to that if possible. And whether it does that through other users uh, or through its own mechanics or through some set of very high level AI um, ideas and, and programs that are operating in the space, a, an emotional uh, program that has thoughts about feelings is something that's really compelling. And we're seeing even more game people talk about uh, incorporating new feelings and then also designing with those feelings in mind. So if we were to look at the spectrum here, we might say that the opposite of that is something totally rational, something based on understanding proofs, and, and in ways kind of thinking about rules much more concretely than the feelings that come from interacting with those rules. So here's an example of something that I might think of as being pretty elegant because it solves a lot of hard problems in some interesting ways, making you think you're playing with little people um, in a really elegant way. I think if you look under the hood of The Sims, it's really super elegant program, even though the code is kind of a disaster. Um, it's expressive, extremely expressive for the people that use it. And it's, it's a relatively new emotional experience. People that got really into The Sims, especially at the time that it came out, it was just, it was just groundbreaking for them. Um, we could look at something that's quite the opposite. Uh, for my lens, and this is all framed through my personal experience, I certainly couldn't speak for all of you, but uh, you know, the, the sort of the phenomena of the sprawling, handcrafted, kind of giant Japanese RPG that has a huge amount of, of sort of character and story all wrapped around you know, a plot that's going to take you over this you know, eons and you know, generations of, of kings and queens or space or whatever it is, um, that's really about mostly taking you on a journey through, through this experience of lots and lots of things that are around you. And we could look at something like Flower, which is a game produced uh, by the company that I work at before I joined it, um, so I can still be a fan. <laughs> uh, 
fairly focused on creating a new emotional experience, fairly elegant in the set of, of choices that it made, but not very expressive, not really trying to get players to do different sorts of things in it, just letting them be a certain way within a sort of narrow frame, really focusing mostly on that emotional output, really skewing in that way. There's Masters of Orion 3, for example, which has tons and tons of rules about really, really interesting events that you can get through and grind through. A massive program, people that have worked on it um, have told me that the AI can play itself. Um, just really, really elaborate program that thought about itself in some ways. Heavy Rain, maybe a little bit higher up on expression, very heavy on emotion, but also really huge, huge effort for that team. They had to come up with some very big, big solutions to make that game. Versus something like Black Ops, which has that real roller coaster experience, but feels a lot more scripted when you get down to it, at least as a single player. Now, again, you know, none of these things are real. I and mean, this is just my frame of reference for these, for these sorts of, of games. Um, you might think, well, what's in that other quadrant? Maybe it's something like Spore. Depending on your feelings about games and the way that you play them, maybe it fits in this space. I'm not interested specifically in where games or game culture is going to take us specifically in this space. I'm interested in the extremes. Um, and I think it's a really interesting thing to ask yourself, what's the most Baroque, scripted, rational experience that could be made? And, and maybe to Ian's point, it wouldn't be very accessible or it would be a strange flower that would only grow in a, in a, in a really weird nuclear environment, I don't know. But it would be really fascinating to me as a player, I would probably give it a shot. Um, Dwarf Fortress, maybe, you know? Would be maybe something in that direction. Um, what's the most elegant, expressive, emotional concept that you could develop? What would that be? What, what's out there in that space? And, and certainly, personally, in my career and at that game company, that tends to be the place that we're pushing. And I was thinking about that. Is that really the future of game culture? Is game culture going to become more focused on these concepts? It, it might be the case that games that focus on the expressive, elegant, emotional end of the spectrum, if you agree with this diagram, are more accessible to just anyone, because they focus on the things that people do all the time, naturally, with each other, without a game around. I don't know if that's true, but it's certainly interesting to think about. So if these three E's are the things that define ways for games to reach people without having to have construct, without having to have explicit logics around them, what's interesting about them? And I'm not sure that this is true, but I suspect that if you can create a space where people can feel those three things together in the extreme, there's a real chance that you can create empathy between the players themselves, that people who feel emotional and can express themselves um, in an elegant way, the barrier between those people comes down. Um, and in some ways, I think the product that I've been working on this game experience thing, um, journey, is about removing all of those interfaces between people and creating that sense of empathy between two people. This is something that, um, that I think about a lot. Wouldn't the world be a better place if the future of game culture encouraged that? That would mean that the E was really about empathy, and that would mean that we were actually contributing something positive to the landscape. Thanks.